fabulous. Right, um, let's share with you the old PowerPoint. Um, uh, here we go. Here we go, here we go, here we go. From the beginning. So here we are. You remember we're going to go through the Apostles' Creed because it's a, a it's a pretty helpful kind of like uh, narrative thread for us doing the doctrine. And we've got to the third bit of it, which is he suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died and was buried. He descended into hell. OK, we're not going to be able to cover all of that tonight, but we'll certainly uh, look particularly at the cross. So let's just pray as we start. and. Um, Many of you will realize that the prayer I've been using thus far is indeed the prayer for Advent, Advent 1 in particular. So let's pray. Almighty God, give us grace to put away the works of darkness and to put on the armor of light. Now in the time of this mortal life in which your son, Jesus Christ, came to us in great humility, that on the last day when he shall come in his glorious majesty to judge the living and the dead, we may rise to the life immortal through him who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. There's a, there's a familiar picture. Anybody know who painted that? Yep, yeah, that's right. I can read your lips, Nancy. Salvador Dali, you said. Yep. Yeah. Um, but what what not many people realize is it was based on a very rough sketch by St. John of the Cross, who was the first one to give the perspective of the father looking down on the um, crucified son. Uh, and it's a lovely little sketch. In fact, have I got it on my... Um, can I find it? Are you going to let me find it, Lord? Let me see if I can find it. Um, Mm. Um, is he going to let me find it? He's not going to let me find it. No, nope, I'm not going to find it. Never mind. <clears throat> anyway, um, here's a really long quote for you um, <clears throat> from Philip Rhinelander. If ever mortal men found a real hero on this earth, those men were the disciples. They indeed were hero worshippers. Then think of the horrid shock and shame which overwhelmed them at the cross. It was no splendid martyrdom for a great cause, no glorious conquest won at the cost of life, no epic to be sung and celebrated. No, the cross was simply an utter overthrow, a speechless failure, sordid, cruel, criminal, a gross injustice, an intolerable defeat of good by evil, of God by devils. He, their hero, their chosen leader, numbered with the transgressors, cast out with a curse on him. Think how loyalty would burn to right this wrong, to clear his memory, save his reputation, prove that gross outrage had been done to him, to magnify the life so the death might be forgotten. But nothing of the kind appears to have occurred to the evangelists. They glory in the cross. They are clear with an absolute conviction that the best and most wonderful thing he ever did was to die a felon's death between two robbers. It was their hero's greatest heroism that he was executed as a common criminal. You see the point Philip Rhineland is making? That, you know, we're so familiar with the cross that we sometimes fail to appreciate that this is by most standards, not um, something your glorious leader, the one to whom you look up, um, should be undergoing. And yet, for Christians in the Gospels, it's absolutely central, suggesting there's something here that's very different from most stories we have understood or heard about great leaders and great heroes. Um, and somebody like Douglas John Hall, who writes on this, he says, uh, there's a big difference between most religions and Christianity. 
Uh, most religions avoid suffering in, in order to have light without darkness, vision without trust and risk, hope without an ongoing dialogue with despair. In short, he says, Easter without Good Friday. But he says, well, while Augustine is right, when Augustine says we are an Easter people and Alleluia is our song, we are also a community of the cross. Now, I don't know if you remember last time I was having a slight pop at uh, Sigmund Freud. Um, and I'll have another pop at Sigmund Freud now because, well, you know, why not? Um, <clears throat> um, so here's Freud talking about religion as a childhood neurosis. Um, and it's not really uh, uh, very important anymore. And we've all achieved maturity and it's all about wish fulfillments. Uh, but of course, what Freud is really critiquing is what I've just talked about. He's critiquing an Easter without Good Friday. No human wish would have come up with a crucified God. I mean, Freud is actually on target with a lot of versions of religion. If you think about, you know, religion as trying to make us simply feel good with spiritual pills to elevate our consciousness, enhance our comfort, and, you know, you go into body, mind and spirit section of W.H. Smith or other bookshops and you've got, you know, lots of pictures of people together, people, sunsets, young women in the lotus position on the end of a Vietnamese pier. You know, the kind of thing, I think. Um, crucifixion sounds a somewhat jarringly different note. Crucifixion was the most the most unsacred, the most secular, irreligious happening ever to find its way into uh, the arena of faith, you know, uh, and we preach Christ crucified, says Paul, and indeed Jesus talks about us taking up our cross. So nowhere does Freud really engage with what is at the center of the Christian faith, which is a million miles away from the the wish fulfillment that he um, accuses all religion of being about. So, <clears throat> so we need to think about this. We need to think about uh, the cross tonight and uh, what it teaches us. Um, so he suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. And um, by the way, why do you think why do you think it mentions he suffered under Pontius Pilate? Why do you think it mentions that bit? I mean, you know, there was also, you know, Caiaphas, the high priest. There was uh, the, the disciples, Peter and others who abandoned him. Why, why does it just mention Pontius Pilate, do you think, in the creed? Any thoughts? Yeah, Nancy? Is it something to do with, although it, he washed his hands of it, he did pass sentence but then he washed his hands is it something to do with that the fact <clears throat> that he was the one who passed sentence on jesus um certainly uh you weren't allowed to put anybody to death unless the romans agreed to it so yeah i mean it was a necessity that it was you know pontius pilate was aligned with the decision yeah because and in john's gospel it says you know um uh, when, the, the, when they brought, when the high, the chief priest brought Jesus to Pilate, he, he says, go and judge them, go and judge him for yourselves. And they say, uh, we're not allowed to put anybody to death, indicating the kind of death that uh, they wanted. And, uh, you know, and when Pilate heard this, he came back in and spoke to Jesus about it. So in other words, you know, that shows it. Yeah. But maybe it's also some people say, because it's trying to moor it historically. You know, it's just trying to say, you know, th 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 this was the time, this was the period, this was the era. And really, you know, one of the things about uh, the Christian faith, unlike, say, Hinduism, is it's so historical and it's so grounded in uh, the earthly realities. So, yeah. So just um, so what I want to do is split this into four elements to cover. And those of you who've been on AOP will, not, will, will be getting a second canter at this, really, because I think I, try, I talked about this a little bit when we were talking about the cross um, last year. But um, therefore, you'll have all of the right answers and responses, which I'm really looking forward to. So um, what I want to talk about in particular, the four elements, are um, 
the manner of the death, um, how this is about something needing to be put right or rectification, um, how it is we are being delivered and from what and to what. And lastly, if we get to it, how does this all relate to the injunctions uh, from Jesus to take up our own cross? So that's what I'd like to talk about. Um, so first of all, let's have a look at, and, we'll, and we'll, we'll discuss each of these, or come out of the PowerPoint for each of them, but let's just start with a horrific death. So this is a, a crucifixion scene from Brazil, which is obviously pretty graphic. Um, so one of the interesting things about the crucifixion is um, the most civilized of empires at the time, the Roman Empire, uh, had the most savage versions of uh, torturing death imaginable and sent arguably the most human of all people to the most dehumanizing of deaths. Arguably the most religious of all peoples, the Jewish nation, um, you know, their chief priests it was, expel the son of God from their midst. Arguably the most disciplined of all soldiers historically to that time, mocked Jesus and cruelly tortured him. And never mind the crowds baying for an innocent's blood and most of Jesus' disciples who cut and ran. When you take a look at the events leading up to crucifixion, in other words, everybody who we thought would be really good turned out to be really not very good at all. And nearly everybody made poor choices. And I do think there's something this illustrates to us about the reality of the human condition, that even the very best of us, for the most part, cannot certainly cannot always control ourselves to make good choices. I mean, we wish it was true. And the self-help books and the sermons and uh, the advice columns keep coming. But it's not true. Certainly not always. And certainly not always when it counts. It's a picture of humanity we wish were untrue. But it appears um, bad choices were made, are made and will be made. And we aren't able to help ourselves all the time. And it seems the story of the crucifixion is one where they did recognize the, their bad choices in some ways. The soldiers acknowledged Jesus at the moment of his death. Truly, this was the son of God. The crowds who had shouted crucify him, they're reported in the Gospels as going home, beating their breasts. They knew that there was something here that was totally awry in their judgment. And his followers, not least the women who watched these things from afar, uh, bewildered by Jesus' death and conscious of something momentous and unprecedented here, something irreversible, and yet, yeah, just a, a huge question mark about it. So there's something wrong here that needs putting right. And I'm gonna come back to that in a minute. But first of all, let's think about the horrific death. The creed anchors the death of Jesus in the governorship of Pilate, as I said, and the death itself is about degradation. Think of the smells, think of the sounds. Um, it's about, uh, and crucifixion itself would twist the body. So um, wrecking, wrecking your psycho um, spiritual balance. It, it's about as godless as, as you can get in terms of the manner of the death. And um, Maltman, a, a theologian of the 20th century, said Christians who do not have the feeling that they must run from the crucified Christ have probably not yet understood it in a sufficiently radical way. Um, and, and the cross itself shows our, our capacity for wickedness and for corruption, our sickeningly violent imagination at times. And also suggests perhaps that there are destructive forces which seem to overtake us and gather momentum 
sort of possessors, if you like, forces that are in business for themselves, which are lethal and which can and do overwhelm us. So what relevance does the manner of Jesus' death have for us as Christians? What relevance does the manner of Jesus' death have for us as Christians? So just take, I'm just going to put you in pairs for a, a minute or two, just to, or there might be a three, um, just to have a conversation about that. And hopefully you get the uh, scenario. Let me just see that we've got the relevant rooms. Okay, so just have a couple of minutes. What relevance does the manner of Jesus' death have for us? I mean, would it have been equally significant if, for instance, Jesus had been beheaded or poisoned or something else. So the manner of Jesus' death. Okay. Off you go. Just wait for everybody to come back. Here we are nearly. 
Got everybody back? Somebody got something on? Can get a bit of feedback there. No. Great. So um, any thoughts? What about this this question? You know, what relevance does the manner of Jesus' death have, if any? What do you think? I think that, I mean, it was a public display and it was, uh, I mean, it was a brutal suffering of all of his being. And it just, it was a visible display of the human sin, you know, um, if it was quick and invisible, you know, I mean, it's just horrendous. Yeah, and I think I think that's right. That word "display" that you use, Diane, um, because I think one of the things that we're having held up to us here is a mirror of our own savagery uh, and the destructiveness of our uh, gone wrongness and gone awryness, our sinfulness, and um, it, it can't get much more graphic in terms of holding up a mirror to us than crucifixion. Whereas, you know, to make it kind of, you know, a lethal injection kind of gives you the, the option of something clinical and cold, but doesn't quite capture, yeah, the graphic nature of that display. Yeah. I think Duncan and I, uh, well, that was named Duncan, actually, um, who kind of brought all of our discussion together, the the least deserving person of all history suffer, suffered the most horrific death. And that was, I mean, that was the, the worst that society could actually throw at anybody at that time. And Jesus actually suffered that death. So no one would have ever, ever be able to say, you know, that there was anything worse. The least deserving suffered the worst. Which I think for me and, and for for us, that's a really humbling um, thing. Mm. Yeah, so the, so there is something about the extremity of it, isn't there? Um, I mean, I, I'm always a bit cautious about saying, uh, uh, I mean, certainly the least deserving, but suffered the worst. Because, I mean, it's very difficult to compare different kinds of suffering. And, you know, you go on TikTok now and you get all these kind of like, you know, ancient forms of torture that you think, oh, yikes, that took three days. They were kind of like covered with the uh, marmite and put in a insect infested log or something. I don't know. Uh, but but um, uh, not that there was marmite in those days, but um, but there is something about about the extremity of it that shows. Um, well, one of the things it shows is that uh, Jesus isn't fooling in his in his uh, in whatever he is, 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 is it is that he's about here he's not fooling in his commitment in his way of being you know and if this is about uh, love for humanity then uh you know this is pretty sobering stuff in its intensity and passion and we talk about the passion and death for a reason that you know to go through that must uh, take some passion yeah. Nancy. Yeah, Ruth and I talked about the, the sacrificial, um, the, the manner in which he died, he died was sacrificial, and he knew what he was getting into, you know, from the Garden of Gethsemane, when we know that he said, you know, if, if you can take this cup from me, but if not, then your will be done. So he knew what he was going to be suffering. He knew the suffering he was going to face. Mm. And he went into it, the sacrificial lamb. Yeah. And there are, there, there, there are many different meanings of that word sacrificial and sacrifice, aren't there? There's the sacrificial in the sense of a gift. So what are we being gifted by this? Well, we're being gifted not least a holding up of a mirror to ourselves, but we're also being gifted something about God in Christ not fooling in his love for us in the degree to which he will go. But the other, the other, one of the other meanings of sacrifice is, uh, comes from the Latin, sacre facia, to make holy. So this is, this is the root uh, somehow through which Jesus is going 
which is a route to making us somehow uh, different as a result, or that somehow because he's treading this, this path, it enables us to tread this path with him in a way that makes us holy, sacre facia. And that's, well, we need to unpack that a bit more, but yeah. And Taylor, I think you've made a comment in the chat there. Uh, how slow and painful, whereas, yeah, beheading is a quick, short shock. Uh, yeah. And, the, and there is something about the agonizingly slow nature of it. It gives Jesus all the time in the world to doubt. It gives uh, the authorities all the time in the world to mock. Uh, and this is this is a kind of death which doesn't just involve physical torture but uh, psychological and spiritual torture as well, uh, not least because of the uh, stretched out nature of it over time. Yeah, Sarah. Um, this is part of the display thing as well, I think, but he was able to speak up until the moment that he died. So that gives an added dimension to his ministry. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. And astonishing the, the nature of that speech, which often forms um, the seven last words for a three hour service on, a, on, a, on, on Good Friday, which was certainly one of the most powerful and uh, converting liturgies I've ever experienced when I was younger. Hmm. OK, so um, that's the first one which is, you know, uh, the, the relevance of uh, the manner of Jesus' death. Let's go back to the screen for the next bit. If I can get there, which one is it? Um, um, that one, I think. We're back on the screen, I hope. So um, the second thing is that there is something wrong that needs to be put right. Um, and I was mentioning just a bit earlier about, you know, how all the very best people of the time were involved in this, in this uh, violence. Um, and, and there's something quite odd about the way in which uh, the media often handles human wickedness today. Uh, and the way we can handle it, given its consistent manifestation throughout history, that we seem to be still somewhat startled and shocked and surprised. It's like, you know, oh, I didn't think it could happen here. I, I can't believe he acted like that. It, it beggars belief, you know, the, 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 the kind of the phrases go on and on and plenty of other remarks conveying the, um, the incredulity of what has always been a human propensity. Um, what, why are we so incredulous? Have we deceived ourselves with a rosy picture of humanity as good and true and upright with just a very, very occasional, um, incomprehensible aberration? If so, then we're pretty poor students of history, aren't we? And lost the capacity, I think, for honest introspection. And those on the receiving end of such wickedness and injustice are outraged, not just by what's been done to them, but also that there's when there is not a putting right of that which is wrong. Um, uh, Diana Ortiz, 19 year old American nun abducted by Guatemalan security forces under American command in the 1990s. Uh, tortured, raped, beaten in exceptionally dreadful manner, so traumatized that she had to be gradually reintroduced to her own family as a result. Uh, she was outraged at having no recourse to justice and not receiving any um, acknowledgement or recognition from her government, from Presidents Clinton or George Bush. Um, she wrote, let me introduce a word into the discussion of whether the US should torture or engage in cruel, inhumane or degrading treatment. 
the word is impunity. It is a word of considerable importance to its survivors. Do you see the point she's making? The outrage that this can happen with impunity, without going, going unpunished and unanswered. Elsewhere, uh, the Croatian theologian, Miroslav Volf, who knew horrendous atrocities perpetrated by and on his own people, he wrote, uh, my thesis will be unpopular with many Christians, especially in the West. Uh, I want you to imagine that you are giving a lecture in a war zone. Among your listeners are people whose cities and villages have been first plundered, then burned, leveled to the ground, daughters and sisters raped, fathers and brothers throats slit. And the thesis is we should not retaliate since God is perfect, non-coercive love. You would soon discover it takes the quiet of a suburban home for the birth of that kind of thesis, that human non-violence corresponds to God's refusal to judge. In a scorched land soaked in the blood of the innocent, such a thesis will die. Now, what Wolf is saying is that if we reduce Jesus' death to being an example of non-violent love we are to imitate, then God has done nothing about the appalling injustices and savagery inflicted by human beings on other human beings. And that is just not good enough. A non-indignant God would be an accomplice to injustice, deception and violence. And the biblical message is that the outrage at all of this is in the very first place in the heart of God as constantly reiterated in the prophets and the voice on behalf of the voiceless and oppressed. So, so what Wolf and others are saying is, uh, there is terrible injustice in the world and it shows us something terribly wrong and it needs to be put right. And actually part of the image of God within us is our awareness and our um, passion for wanting to put things right. And putting it right, justice, it is not just narrowly to be associated with punishing somebody else, but with a, with a whole restitching of the moral world so that our sons and daughters don't get stabbed at night or stolen from their beds with impunity. And we need to know that there is a putting right and that while the arc of the moral universe is long, it is curved towards justice. And one of the, one of the interesting things here is to think about something like the wrath of God. Now, the wrath of God is, is pretty out of fashion these days. When, when did you last hear a sermon on the wrath, wrath of God? Recently? Oh, you see, yeah. And you know how many references there are to it in scripture? Any guesses? 600 plus. You've got to do a lot of cutting out of the Bible to get rid of the wrath of God. Quite a lot. Uh, Leslie Newbigin, um suggests and he is a bible scholar of note that the wrath of god is the reverse side of his love or desmond tutu said god's love resisted is felt as wrath it is god's if you like hard-nosed refusal to have god's purposes thwarted wrath is not forgiveness forgiveness is part of what jesus effects on the cross but it isn't a complete description of what Jesus does in total. Something is wrong and needs to be made right. Forgiveness must be understood in its relation to justice if the Christian gospel is to have its full scope. And that setting right, you could talk about as 
rectification. It's often translated in, in the New Testament as justification, but justification has come to mean something quite different from putting things right, which is why I prefer to use rectification, really, because justification can mean, you know, self-justification, and colloquially it's got some baggage with it. Um, and that this putting right is often hijacked by a crude understanding of Jesus' death. And, and that crude understanding is Jesus gets the punishment we deserved and that exhausts the punishment. And, and, and the trouble with that is um, it, 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 it gives a sense of uh, a, a retribution by God who's offended. And we trade our distinctive Christian message for just cold, hard justice that we've seen down the ages um, but we do need at the same time to take seriously the many texts that talk about Jesus bearing in his body our sin and that, that there is something to do with punishment here the challenge I think is is to understand where we put the emphasis and I think the emphasis needs to be put on the undoing of sin on, on the cross, Paul describes the only begotten Son of God delivering sinful humankind over to destruction in God's own person as the Son. So Christ submits to the curse that lays upon us because of sin and death and the law. Uh, and it's the curse of God against all that prevents creation's flourishing. But it's not to give a harsh father his pound of flesh, but to put to death everything that prevents God's good purposes and to bring us back to God. So I would suggest that the challenge is to understand that what is being punished on the cross is everything that is at odds with God's purposes for us. God is hostile. God is wrathful but only hostile and only wrathful to our self-destructive hostility and our wrath. God invades the world of impunity and is beginning to set it right in the cross. Now, there's a, there's a word I need to introduce here, which is prolepsis, because what God is doing in the cross is setting it right proleptically. Proleptic means something which what well, it says there it's an anticipation the representation or assumption of a future act or development as if presently existed or accomplished so through the death of jesus something is definitively changed but we need to appropriate that in our committed relationship with jesus but what we see in jesus in his death and then his resurrection is a proleptic putting right that God in Jesus promises to complete come the kingdom of God. This is not the father crudely punishing the son in our stead to get us off the hook, but this is the father and the son together with the spirit taking on themselves our warranted punishment for the sake of undoing our alienation. So our future is not determined by death, revealing our waywardness and his loving forgiveness and deliverance of us to his kingdom, if we would have it. So I want to say the divine judgment is not so much executed upon Jesus as executed through Jesus. God the Father, in his love for us, hands over his cherished Son, but this is due also to the Son's love for us, so that Jesus and his Father's gratuitous self-gift makes God's love for us and purposes for us plain. Now, that's quite a lot to take in. So, um... Here's something from Paul. When you were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made you alive together with him. When he forgave us all our trespasses, erasing the record that stood against us with all its legal demands, he set this aside, nailing it to the cross. So Paul is clear 
something is done here something is finished yeah something has been uh achieved to engage with the cross is to recognize we are guilty and judged and simultaneously to realize it seems we are freed and that now in jesus christ there is a new creation and that's really important because going back to what i was talking about earlier the human condition mine and yours and how you know we keep screwing up we begin to see why strangely jesus passion and death is in our helplessness good news jesus doesn't offer us sound advice which we then have to follow he doesn't appeal to our better natures he doesn't give us stirring speeches to inspire us to make good choices he knows we're stuck even if we're in denial he's not and realizing our paralysis and inability to get better he gives himself for us there's our sin, our law-breaking, our stunningly selfish bad choices. And the good news of his passion and death is that something happens here that is gift for us. Something happens here which we can't do ourselves. Something happens here by which we are, in the words of Paul and the Gospels, we are made new, released or saved so next question for you what is put right by jesus what is put right by jesus and i'm going to give you Eight minutes to mull that over individually because you need to go and make yourself a hot drink too. So it's 1947. So we'll come back at 1955 and we'll have a quick conversation about what is put right by Jesus. Okay.
Welcome back. So, um, what is put right by Jesus? Any thoughts? Um, Diane? I wonder, I wonder if it's something about um, our separation from God and the reconciliation we have through Christ. Yeah. So, uh, do you want to say some more? No, that's what I want to say. Okay. Um, so, yeah, so you certainly have this in Paul, don't you, uh, in Romans 5, um, that, that some, something, and, and it's not that God is mad with us and needs to be reconciled to us, uh, but, but God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. So, in other words, we're the ones in need of being reconciled. Because just like Adam and Eve before us and everybody else, and we know in our own hearts and minds, we want it our way. Thank you very much. You know, not 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 God's way. And we know how that's gone since Adam and Eve. Thank you very much. Which is not very well. So so there is something about what Jesus effects objectively at one level in terms of the reconciliation, because he is both fully human the most naturally human and by natural i mean utterly open to and transparent to the creator god so th there's something about what he affects objectively in creating that reconciliation through his particular humanity but that is now open to us to be part of too that reconciliation but it's also the case that we have a god who uh utterly respects our freedom and doesn't ride roughshod over us and doesn't reconcile us willy-nilly without our subjective engagement and involvement. So we still have to appropriate the fruits of what Jesus has done for us there. Yeah. But, you know, it, it's quite a tough call in some ways, because as T.S. Eliot says, people are absorbed in an endless struggle to think well of themselves. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, you know for for the cross to be a gift to us and for what jesus has done to to be a gift to us we need to actually get a reality check that maybe i do need to be reconciled and maybe i am kind of like you know <laughs> unreconciled here and in, in need of that um so yeah so thank you yeah and any other thoughts about what what is put right by jesus yeah, Rick. Uh, along the same lines as what Diane just said, but it's about a restoration of um, an ability to have a relationship, an open relationship where we can actually come into God's presence. Because when after Jesus' sacrifice, the curtain in the temple was ripped, but it wasn't ripped from the bottom up, it was ripped from the top down. And so that means God opened the way for us to come into his presence. But that wasn't possible until Jesus did what he did on the cross. So there's something about what Jesus did that actually renders us capable of actually now coming into the presence of God. We still have to choose to do it. And there's still some things that we need to do to be right as well. But that way is now open. And, and we're not subject to all of the restrictions of the law. That would have been the way before and absolutely no way to do it because you couldn't be perfect. And yeah. that was that was the way. So now we don't have to be perfect because perfection has already been that's already been done by Jesus. And we get to now be a part of that perfection. And yeah. it's an invitation. We can accept it or not. Yeah. So uh, another way of putting that is a way has been forged. Yeah. A way has been forged through the person and uh, uh, passion and death and resurrection of Jesus. And, and again, we've got to be so careful with our words here, because even that can be misunderstood, because then Jesus could just be thought of as an example, right? He set us away, now we just not need to walk the way. And it's not quite like that. I mean, as Herbert McCabe said, he said, um, Jesus didn't die and rise, so we don't have to. Jesus died and rose so that we could die and rise with Jesus. And that is hard. 
he added. <laughs> but the way has been forged, but the way is Jesus, John 14. Yeah. <laughs> so there's something about this is about, you know, the way has been forged, but it is only in and with and through Jesus uh, that, that that way is traveled. Yeah. Um, Clive, are you just saying cheers or are you putting your mug up to speak? You're on mute there, Clive. No, I'm holding my mug while typing with the other finger. Oh, OK, fair enough. Like. <laughs> yeah, I wasn't sure. Right. Sarah, I think you are holding. Well, just just something about the total reevaluation of values, because it's such a radical thing for the, the leader, the king, if you like to be so subjugated in such a humiliating way. And that turns everything upside down. So it would, it would um, uh, challenge all previous existing values, particularly in relation to established religion and kingship and all of those things. Yeah. It's a very radical thing. Yeah. So one of the things that's put right by Jesus is is our uh, under, understanding of God. Yes. And God's love for us. This is kind of like radically different. This this, you know, going back to what I was talking about with the gods of the time, this is no arbitrary and uh, capricious God waiting to be impressed and might even kind of like, you know, deign to have a conversation with us occasionally if we've done sufficiently well. There's nothing like that here. This is a, a God besotted with us, desperate for union with us, willing to go to any lengths to realise that, come what may, to uh, his own being. Yeah, it's a, a radical reevaluation of, and, and therefore a radical reevaluation of values. I mean, one of the interesting things about Christianity is, uh, before Christianity, humility was never, ever regarded as a virtue. It was just nuts. What do you mean you're not going to talk about how good you are and what you've done and how many degrees you've got and how you ran the 100 metres in 10.5? And have you got to talk about that? I mean, I say, yeah, I? <laughs> so, yeah, it's a reevaluation of values and a reevaluation of the nature and character of God. And as a consequence, a reevaluation of the nature and value of ourselves. We are unbelievable. The irony of the cross is while it shows us the terrible wickedness we are capable of, it also short shows us the gobsmacking value we have in the sight of God. Yeah. Sarah. Well, one other thing, we haven't got to it yet, but there was a resurrection as well. Yeah, no, well, you know, we you know we'll get there, we'll get there. Yeah, but, I'm a bit yeah. like, I'm a bit like those old uh, Lone Ranger and Tontos, you know, we could leave it a cliffhanger at the end of the episode <laughs> every time. <laughs> yeah. OK, great. Well, let's move on. Um, so I'll give you a few more slides now. Let me come and see if I can get where are we there, I think. Uh, yeah, there we are. So what is put right by Jesus? That's what we've just done. Uh, and then I was going to talk a little bit about deliverance. I mean, there are a number of themes to do with the cross and I've, I've, I'm not I'm not exhausting them all here, but I'm talking about a few. And another of the themes is deliverance. Uh, Rowan Williams, when he was asked if he could only use two words to describe, uh, you know, the theme of the, the story of the Bible, what would it be? And he said, hmm, exodus and adoption which I thought was a really interesting combination of, uh, you know, adoption as children of God, but also Exodus, because, you know, we see the liberation in the Old Testament. And there's a sense in which somehow the cross is a deliverance for us. Um, you'll know that passage from uh, 2 Corinthians 4. I want to talk a little bit in terms of deliverance about a film that usually divides the audience, The Passion of the Christ. Some people think it's gross because it just focuses far too much on the physical agonies of Jesus and uh, that this was not something that actually is true to the Gospels, which pass over 
very swiftly the physical issue of Jesus' passion and death and, and focuses more on things like the mockery and uh, uh, the ministry of Jesus from the cross and so on. But one of the really interesting things, I think, that Gibson's Passion of the Christ captures is the nature of evil. Um, and it's evil with a capital E that we see in, in the Passion of the Christ. Now, you can take you can take Satan literally or you can take uh, uh, it as evil, as I say, with a capital E. And I don't want to get too sidetracked into that. We can have a conversation about that. Well, I suppose now, but it will take a bit of time if we did. I mean, but I mean, for instance, the death camps of the Nazis, uh, the concentration camps were described as kingdoms of evil. And there's a difference between something being wrong that needs to be put right, which is what I was talking about earlier, and evil. Because evil suggests a force in business for itself with the will to negate, doesn't it? Do you see what I'm saying? Recent commentator, Del Banco, secular liberal, not a Christian. I believe our culture is now in crisis because evil remains an inescapable experience for all of us while we no longer have a symbolic language for describing it. Nevertheless, it's tricky for us these days to talk about this stuff. Give you an example from the Pope. Uh, the Pope at the end of a four day summit on uh, the awfulness of paedophile priests and clerical cover ups spoke of the, the mystery of evil, as he put it, and abusers as tools of Satan. Um, and what he was trying to convey was his sense of deep theological horror. But what many survivors of sexual abuse felt was that this was a stunning letdown, his language. They mostly understood the word Satan as a myth or a metaphor, and it sounded to them like shifting the blame away from actual abusers. Do you see? So there are complications here uh, when we start talking about evil and Satan. Um, but so I just need to kind of like preface any remarks with an awareness that there are complications here. But in the film, The Passion of the Christ, uh, Gibson clearly uh, goes for um, the, the uh, image of Satan. And Satan is, is this guy here uh, that you can see. Um, uh, 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 and it's depicted by Gibson as a presence that, that is destructive of us, that leads us to all sorts of wickedness, to alienating us from God and from those around us. Um, and Gibson argues that what he's picking up here is that, uh, you know, in the New Testament, there are not two powers, God and humanity. There are three powers. There's God, humanity and evil or Satan, which is in business for itself. There is, if you like, the dominion of darkness. And Gibson's film has this guy, uh, Satan, carrying around a, a fairly grotesque and contented kind of baby human being in his arms through the crowd around the scene of the seemingly endless beating of Jesus. And there's a look of self-satisfaction on the face of the, the, the baby human being in Satan's arm, expressing the fact that Satan or evil has humanity under its thumb and is using human beings in their deluded condition to torture Jesus. And evil's tools include physical force, impressive appearance and the gratification of desire. And, you know, we think, ah, we're, we're much more civilised and morally upright now. These things wouldn't happen. And the ones who commit atrocities in our world, ISIS, Mexican drug barons, dictators, they're aberrations that are slowly being phased out as we continue to progress. Which, as I said earlier, I do think is a little bit optimistic and hopelessly rose tinted. Gandhi was nearer the mark when he was asked, what do you think of human civilization?" And replied, I think it would be a good idea. Uh, the historical facts do not suggest that the myth of progress is anything other than a myth when it comes to our morality and spirituality. And what we're ready and willing to do, given the power 
given the secrecy, given the impunity, remains quite shocking. And we don't appear to be any nearer goodness than many other areas, eras. So how are we delivered from this, to put it in those terms? Well, one of the ways of understanding it, and that the New Testament understands it, is to suggest that evil with a capital E or Satan knows that Jesus is the only truly radical person to enter human history, because Jesus, if undiverted, will refuse to use evil to defeat evil and will set afoot a new order that does not employ the devices by which evil persons try to secure themselves and get their way. So from the get-go, evil's project was to stop Jesus from getting to his redemptive act of crucifixion, to try through Jesus' earthly life, to destroy him or deflect him or uh, distract him or um, in one way or another, put him off course. Nevertheless, what we find here is that, as Colossians 1.13 puts it, he delivers us from the dominion of darkness and transfers us to the kingdom of his beloved son, and that this transferring is not like um, a concept of journey. It's, it's a transfer which has a kind of immediacy about it that you see at baptism. There's an immediate trans transfer, not, not dependent on the baptizan's progress to a spiritual goal. It's an objective fact of our redemption. And it's the force that drives all the resulting subjective response and consequent imitation of Christ. Deliverance means a transfer of eons, an exchange of one kingdom for another. If you like, the powers and principalities may not know it, but their foundations have been undermined and cannot last. Creation has been invaded. Some people talk about um, the way in which it's a bit like D-Day crucifixion. From then on, everybody knows that the war is only going in one direction, even though the enemy forces are still at work. And you could think of such forces as, you know, all sorts of things, the money, the market, sex, the pleasure, law, tradition, race. The, the list goes on and on of all the principalities and powers that could be co-opted for wickedness or evil purposes but that something about what happens in the cross has fundamentally and irreversibly uh, shaken them at their foundation so they don't have the same hold over us that they did have. So, so to summarize the New Testament, perhaps in terms of deliverance, one way of looking at it is perhaps to say, uh, at the historical time and place of Jesus' uh, inhuman and godless crucifixion, all the forces that were against God's purposes were loosed in the world and convened in Jerusalem and unleashed their power on the incarnate Son of God. Derelict, outcast and forsaken, he hung there as the representative of all humanity suffered condemnation in the place of humanity in collaboration with the Father to break the power of sin and death over humanity. Mm. Well, there's a mouthful. So deliverance, what are we delivered from and to by Jesus? I'm going to put you in breakout rooms for about three minutes just to have a conversation about that. And if I can wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Let me move one person. Uh, to room. There we go. Then you've all got somebody to speak to, I think. Yeah. OK, away you go.
progress. Welcome back. Um, so, so what are we delivered from and to, would you say? Any thoughts? Always me, but... <laughs> Diane, go for it. Shall I go for it? <laughs> I thought it was, uh, it was too obvious that we are delivered from sin and evil to a life in Christ. Well, um, it, whether it's obvious or not, I mean, you know, I, the previous slide also gave you the answer to this, this discussion. So <laughs> it's kind of, you know, I'm uh, you know, <laughs> just trying to help you to kind of, like, you know, ground your thinking here. So, yeah, be, be, feel free to be obvious. <laughs> but any, any other thoughts on that? Yeah. I mean, do you, do you buy this stuff about delivered from the dominion of darkness into the kingdom of light? What do you think? I mean, am I am I off my rocker here? Have I watched too many Hammer horror movies? I don't think so. And 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 we um we kind of went a little bit further, extrapolated a little bit on that darkness and light theme because it's a it's it's really a case of ignorance and knowledge, isn't it? I mean, not knowing God and not knowing the relationship we can have with God, and then knowing. The relationship we can't have with God, knowing actually how much God values us and loves us, that comes through Christ. Mm -hmm. And prior to that, I don't know that that was something that would have been widely or could have even been widely known. So it's deliverance. The darkness of light is is ignorance to knowledge. Yeah. So that's really interesting because Jesus does say on the cross, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Um, so there's something about how acting in ignorance. Uh, um, it's interesting the, the way in which the New Testament distinguishes between the demonic and the satanic, isn't it? The demonic is when you're split against yourself. So part of you wants to go in one direction and one part of you goes in another direction. So you're split against yourself. So it's an indicative of a sick soul, because I understand the soul is that which integrates us and aligns us. But the satanic is willfully opposed knowingly <laughs> to God's purposes. Yeah. So it's, yeah, it's interesting. But I, th um, but, but I mean, since Christ, since we have the Holy Spirit, I mean, we, there's less ignorance for those who are in Christ. I mean, we, we, we know and are convicted of, of these things. Yeah. Delivered into, delivered into the kingdom of light is um something that doesn't actually mean we just got to sit by the side of the highway and wait for you know uh, jehoshaphat's chariot to come along or whatever um does it, it, it but, but there is still a collaboration with the holy spirit to be undertaken but there is something about how things have shifted in terms of deliverance yeah any other thoughts about deliverance, what we're delivered from and what we're delivered to? Yeah, Sarah. Well, we, we started off by talking about uh, darkness into light and realised that that was actually a bit sort of, well, a bit of a metaphor, which was, you know, needed a bit of unpacking and what, what exactly it was about Christ that was doing this. And we thought that the key thing actually was his embodiment in, mm. in humanity, um, demonstrating throughout his ministry the interactions in in within humanity which made the difference yeah and i think uh, the older i get and the longer i go on the more i think there's something about the particularity of jesus humanity that's really significant it's not just that he's you know a template and we're all human in a generic way but i mean the eucharist for instance there's something about us feeding on the particularity of jesus that, that, that is really striking um so yeah that embodiment that there's something about and there's something about our embodiment of christ in ourselves that enables us to live out of that kingdom of light so there's something here which is quite quite mysterious in a way but um fundamental it seems yeah clive 
Yeah, when we were talking about deliverance, we also looked at, well, I, I was looking at hope and hopelessness, that darkness is hopelessness, and we're delivered from that hope, sense of hopelessness, hopelessness to a sense of hope. And that's one mm -hmm. of the other areas, I think, of deliverance that I, I feel anyway. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and 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 yeah, you you could play that theme with a few a few a few areas, couldn't you? Like we're we're uh, delivered from mistrust of not knowing whether we've got a capricious or you know arbitrary deity, to one who uh, will move hell and high water to get to us, for instance. So we're delivered to that kingdom, the kingdom of trust. Therefore, that this is this is a god we can trust in, who is not fooling in his love for us. Yeah. Mm. Um, we've got uh, just a few minutes to talk about taking up our cross. Um, one of the teachings of Jesus is, is, is that we're not just gazing in reverence at the cross, important as that is, not just upheld by it, not just guaranteed by it, not just secured by it, but we're also set in motion by it. Something about the cross that sets us in motion, that energizes us and um, kind of uh, directs us. Uh, it, 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 so so there's something about us taking up our own cross what how do you understand that any thoughts about taking up our own cross what's that about yeah nancy i think this um kind of feeds back to the discussion we had about emptying ourselves of our own, um, what our desires are, and you know, our misunderstandings, and coming into the presence and light of God, and understanding for our lives, you know, what is actually what God wants from us, and and sort of aligning aligning ourselves with God. Mm. And our, uh, aligning our lives so it, it's that kind of you know i think last time we said about mother Teresa and uh, julian of knowledge they uh, julian of norwich they emptied themselves so that god's will could be done in their lives yeah so there's there's something about um desire our desires isn't there and, and and you talk about aligning our desires i mean so i think about for instance learning to swim you know i i quite i quite desire to be warm and i quite desire to be dry and those desires have to be ridden over if i want to learn to swim i have to get in cold water <laughs> i have to get wet and i have to splash around and get you know chlorinated water in my mouth uh, but actually for the sake of coming by a way of being i would never otherwise realize gliding through the water and enjoying a kind of freedom that goes with that that is completely different so there's something about uh, yeah uh, uh, the cross as being taking up our cross as being a way of um being uh drawn by our deeper desires rather than those shallow desires that can lead us away from our true fulfillment yeah i think there's an element as well of the that our hearts have a capacity for love that we can explore more fully when when we do empty ourselves out of our um, flesh desires, our human desires. When we can become fit into that spiritual space, we can explore. Certainly, that is my experience of that to explore the depth of my love. Yeah. And we're taken up by something bigger, something more noble, yeah. something good and wholesome and true. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Diane, did you want to come in? Yeah, I've, I've always seen it as a sacrificial service and thinking about service not always being an easy path. Um, a suffering for the lost, you know, and, and that is by embodying Christ and his love and pouring out of his love, but through sacrificial service giving up giving up stuff to to bring the gospel yeah and and strangely in the christian tradition from 
Paul and Silas in a Philippian jail through to St. Francis uh, of Assisi down to the present day, there's been an association of that with joy. That somehow, and that's not a kind of like glib happiness, but something about how in being caught up in that dynamic, we're caught up in a in a kind of with Jesusness that um is that kind of awareness and experience of a matchless goodness that can transform even our darkest moments of that suffering. And I mean, I'm, I'm not trying to be rose tinted about it because, you know, Francis really suffered and Paul really suffered, but there's something about it that takes us up into something that puts us in touch with a matchless goodness. That's, that's different. We have one minute. Any further comments? Next week, the sequel. <laughs> when we come to resurrection, one of the things that I should say about this is we cannot, of course, separate incarnation from passion and death from resurrection. They come as a whole. And the Christian faith was forged in the crucible of that whole story, not the kind of modular bits that I'm doing it in. OK, so it's as a whole that we need to thoroughly understand crucifixion. And of course, we understand partly what we're delivered from and to in the light of the resurrection, because we're delivered to that new creation, which is the risen life in and with Jesus, which we um realize as we live out of the power and energy of the Holy Spirit. More anon next week, but let us pray. Uh, Lord, as we gaze at uh, the cross, at that symbol of your uh, incredible love for, your, for us, of your love for us, of your seeking of us, of your being on our side, and of your relentless desire for us, help us, Lord, to understand through and by that our incredible and absolute value in your sight and uh, to be taken up more and more uh, by your Holy Spirit in realizing who we are to you and with you. In the name of our crucified Savior, we ask. Amen. Thank you, everybody. See you next week. Thank you. Bye-bye now. Thank you. See you next week. Thank you.